Hey everybody, it's Jared, your host with All Things Crime. Welcome back to another episode. Just wanted to let you know that this is our 36th episode and I cannot thank all of you enough for supporting us and for watching and listening to our podcast. And I, I, it's just a great honor to be able to bring these episodes to you. We have a special episode today. We have Cloyd Steiger. And I remember our conversation uh, was just absolutely awesome, but I didn't realize how long it was. So I wanted to let you know that we are gonna be dividing this up into two parts. And so part one and part two should actually both come out this week. So I'll, I'll work really hard to make sure we do that. But I wanted to let you know that so that uh, when it, if it just kind of abruptly ends, that you'll know that part two is coming soon. So thanks again. Hope you uh, continue to subscribe and share it with your friends and definitely uh, give us a good rating if you like what you're hearing and um, definitely tell us uh, what you want to hear. If there's a specific thing that you want us to cover in all things crime, such as, you know, how, like, for example, today, Cloyd and I are talking about what it's like to be a homicide investigator. So if there's something specific in the investigative process that you would like to, us to explore more, I'd be more than happy to do that to you. So send us an email. Or, or comment on the YouTube channel, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. So here comes part one, and I hope you enjoy it. Cloyd uh, is one of the best homicide investigators and has investigated more homicides than just about anybody else I've ever even heard of, let alone know. And he's also just an absolute amazing guy. So hope you enjoy. A lot of stuff's going on and you know and that, and that's a, a, that way across the board in big city departments but also these small rural sheriff's office their detectives most of their time they're taking is child molest cases and sex crimes you know and things like that and because that goes on everywhere you know it goes on everywhere and it's just wow. uh, yeah it's we want to know why there's so many screwed up people in society oh, yeah no it's no that doubt. right there the, i gotta tell you though i the good side of that without mentioning anything about the case is I got a message about three or four years ago from a, a man saying, when I was a little boy, something terrible happened to me and you took care of me. And I just, I've always thought about you and thank you for what you did. And, and we're Facebook friends now. I follow his family and everything. And it's real nice, he's successful, got kids of his own. So that was very rewarding to me to have this, who was four, I think, when this stuff happened to him. Wow. He's now an adult and you know, remembered and reached out to me three or four years ago and geez, i just want to always say thank you because you know i got the guy and everything and, and that was a stranger case it wasn't a family case mm -hmm. so um you know that was and that's a rewarding thing you know one, one of those yeah. feel good stories Cloyd, welcome back to All Things Crime. Thanks, Jared. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, you are my second guest that has actually come back for a second episode. And there's <laughs> two reasons that I want to bring you back. The number one is to apologize because you were one of the very first uh, episodes for All Things Crime. And I'm not even sure it was called All Things Crime when we first did that. Yeah, I don't remember. The reason uh, I, I wanted to bring you back and apologize straight, right up front is because if, if you go back to that episode and listen to that, I'm sure you're just going like, oh my Lord, what, how pathetic was that interview? <laughs> I don't <Right>? think so. <laughs> yeah. They say yeah. every, every podcaster and video cat, you know, anybody on YouTube, anything, they say it's, it's all about the journey. Right. And it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you were one of those first victims. Yeah. And I, I, when I decided to do this, I thought, you know what, who can I get that's a good friend that is also would be a great guest and I can get them on my, on my podcast and use them kind of as a, as a guinea pig. And you were it, man. There so, I am. I'm your guinea pig. That's right. The lab rat. <laughs> that's right. So Cloyd Steiger, 40 years in law enforcement, lab rat. So there that's you right. go. Yeah, there you go. No, so I wanted to bring you back. Number one, 
because uh, in between our two, our two episodes, I think you've actually put out another book. And so we got to talk about that. Now that the, that the show has kind of evolved into what it, it's, it's currently at, and hopefully it continues to evolve and get better, mm-hmm. uh, but especially based on how pathetic that first interview was, <laughs> um, we definitely I'll need to make up for it. try to do better this time. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, listen to you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, taking credit where you don't have any, any right to take credit for it. If we're going to, if we're going to actually place blame on uh, how pathetic that was, it is hundred percent with me because <laughs> I was directing the questions and you were simply answering and uh, it was anyway. All right. Uh, so I've braided myself enough here, but okay. from here, I want to actually get into what this show is actually about now. And that's the investigative process. Right. So I think, I think when we first got started, it was more focused on DNA right? and specifically with the MBAC, because that's where our commonalities are. Right. But now it's evolved into talking about the entire process, the entire investigative process. And really I, so I, I literally just got off another interview with uh, a, a police officer who is currently He's an active police officer and he, he's on the streets every day. Mm-hmm. And so his perspective of what's going on, but then, you know, I've, I've also interviewed crime scene investigators and now you being a homicide detective and all of your wealth of experience, but I've also interviewed defense attorneys and people right. on the other end, lab people. So right. I, I'm trying to get the whole gamut. And The biggest reason I think is just like what we were talking about a little earlier, that there's a lot of people that seem to have opinions on things that they, current events and how things should be done. And they really have no experience. Right. And have really no right. They haven't earned the right to voice their opinion about those things. Right. And that's why I wanted to get guys like you on because Clearly, with your 140 years of law enforcement experience, <laughs> no, how, how many years have you been in total in law enforcement total? Well, total um, would probably be 40, 41 years, something like that. Yeah. Okay. 36 so, years with Seattle, and then my job at the Attorney General's office, and now I'm retired. But I'm still doing it because of ISOC, ASOC, and you know, right. American Investigative Society cold cases. And other groups that I'm involved in, I'm still doing, I'm still reviewing and, and consulting on cases. So, And how many of those specifically with homicide? How many homicides did I handle? Well, I know you were like over 200 homicides, right? Yeah, 250, something like that. And then, uh, you know, I consulted and reviewed on dozens more in the last, it's in the, in the five years since I've retired, I'd say 20, 25 cases since then. Wow. Yeah. So how many, how many years did you serve as a homicide detective? Oh, 22 years as a homicide detective. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, on anybody's standard, that is an amazing amount of experience. And I, I, I don't think there's very many people in the entire world, honestly, that could say, yes, I have more experience than Cloyd Steiger. So to me, you are like the ideal guest to talk about homicides okay. All right. just just so you know okay <laughs> sometimes it's murder <laughs> yeah right it is yeah. just it just kills you right yeah exactly yeah yeah and you're uh you you certainly have that homicide you know cop sense of humor right that, yeah uh is also is also fun so now that we've got all those administrative things out of the way and we've mm-hmm. properly apologized hopefully and, and you'll forgive me for that first episode. Maybe I'll just go back and delete it. And, yeah, you know, you I, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I, w- I want people to be able to go back and say, you know, let's go back and see how bad this thing really yeah. was. Wow, he's really improved. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they say that. You're going to get the most improved trophy. <laughs> yeah. I'll get, you know, if not, I'll get like three downloads on this episode and everybody will go, ah, that yeah. show's really, I'm going to delete that show. So yeah, there you go. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But yeah. All right. So, Cloyd, tell yes, us. Sir. First of all, how you got involved with police and law enforcement, you know, what, what made you decide to become a law enforcement officer and then how you got involved in homicide and, right. and most importantly, why you stuck with homicide. Okay. 
Well, I decided I wanted to be a police officer when I was 10 years old, watching Adam 12 on TV. I mean, it was as simple as that. I had no family in that. I just went, that looks like a cool job. So I went and told my parents, yeah, I want to be a police officer. They go, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Go do your homework. And then, <laughs> but, but I, uh, I was serious and I never wavered. And I, you know, I went to my school library and I checked out all the books I could on, you know, careers in law enforcement and how to become a police officer and all this kind of stuff. And then as I went, you know, into junior high, I did the same things. I go to the public library and read all the books I could on it in high school. And then uh, when I got to high school, I was reading a lot more, like I would read true crime books a little bit. And so then I thought, man, I, yeah, I want to be a police officer, but I think it'd be cool to be a homicide detective someday. So that was kind of my goal when I joined the police department. So, uh, I mean, I, then I went was, to school. I'm sorry, what, go ahead. What was the draw? I just thought it was fascinating. Sounded like fascinating work to me at the time. Of course, a lot of people think that, you know, people that read true, and of course, by the way, I don't read true crime now because it's like reading work at home, right? <laughs> I do write it, but it's just it's still a chore, but, but it's, uh, but true crime is hot now. And because you read that, you go, oh my God, there's a lot into this. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating process and you got to know a lot of things about a lot of things. And, uh, you know, and just tracking somebody down, having no idea what happened to begin with, and then putting the pieces together and tracking somebody down. It sounded like very satisfying work, and it was. So, and that's what I did. And then, so I went to school, majored in criminal justice. I went to work on an ambulance in the meantime as an EMT, figuring that was an emergency service and get me into, you know, that, that way. And then uh, when I was 20 and a half years old, which is the minimum age you have to be to test, I called the Seattle Police Department. And I said, are you guys hiring? And they said, yes, we are. And, they said, and, I, and so they said, we'll send you an application and a study pack. So they sent me this application and then it came with this study pack, about 110 pages. And so I literally, I filled out the application, sent it in. I literally poured over it over and over and over till I almost had it memorized verbatim. Because, you know, I was, not, I was 20 and a half years old. And then, so a buddy of mine at the same time, uh, when I applied, he goes, maybe I'll take the test too. Okay, yeah, so he went to take the test. And we got two different test dates. I was, he was on a Saturday and I was on a Sunday. So on the Saturday, he went to his test date and he was gone a long time. And when he came home, I said, how was it? He goes, man, there were like a thousand people there. I'm like, really? And the next day I went on a Sunday and there were another thousand people there. And I thought, oh, the odds of me getting hired here aren't that good. And then, But I did the test. I was pretty confident, like I said, because I memorized everything in the study packet. And then they had pictures that I just looked at and looked at till I could picture them in my mind. And then uh, I got a couple of weeks later, I got a card in the mail. You're number 13 on the list. <laughs> We're gonna, and then they called me and I started doing the rest of the testing process. And uh, it took about, well, I took the test, written test in March. And they were going to put me in an academy class in October. And I said, you know, I'm not 20, I mean, September, I'm not 21 till October. And they went, oh, <laughs> okay. And then, so I started in November, that was 1979 and went to the police academy and then did that and got assigned my field training, did my field training. And I finally ended up in patrol, um, third watch, which is 8 p.m. to 7, or 4 a.m. in Rainier Valley, which at that time, we called it the Rainier Valley Knife and Gun Club. It was kind of the bad neighborhood you know a lot of stuff going on shootings all the time and and that's where i kind of cut my teeth uh after i got an opportunity to go to the swat team so i did that for a while had a lot of fun repelling and shooting automatic weapons and and doing all kinds of stuff and a couple call outs and things like that and then i went uh back patrol at an east precinct up on capitol hill in seattle third watch again and then at some point i finally said you know if i'm going to do this detective thing i probably better start doing it so what you had to do that time is you took a written test to, be, to become a, a detective. And if you pass the test, you're on an eligibility list, and then you got to find your own job. So I went around to the precinct detectives, uh, supervisors, and I worked nights. So it was hard for me because they were days. So, you know, unless I was in for court or something, it was hard for me. I didn't go to work till eight o'clock at night, unless I want to come downtown, which was a 25 mile commute for me and, and go and talk to these guys and either hang out or go back home and come back in. But a couple of times I was, I was like downtown during the day for court or something. And I, I went, I, I went into this, Tom Wachowski was Lieutenant in the East precinct uh, detectives. And I remember going up to him and I'm saying, Hey, uh, Lieutenant, I'm looking for a detective job. You're going to take any detectives on? And he goes, yeah, this is in January. He says, yeah, we're probably not going to take any till the summer. I said, okay, well, when you do keep me in mind, he goes, I will. And I left. Well, a couple of weeks later, I was, there was a big social event, police social event. And I was there 
with my wife and friends. And somebody comes up to me and says, hey, congratulations. I saw you made detective. I said, I did? <laughs> yeah, it was on the order. You're going to the, the East Precinct detectives. I was, You're kidding me. So I went to a phone. I called the desk officer at the East Precinct and said, are there some orders for me up there? And he looks, yeah, you're going on, you know, it was actually February 14th, 1990. You're going to you're going to the detective unit on February 14th. I went, wow, I didn't have any idea. So just like that, a couple of weeks later, when he said, we're not taking anybody, then I was there. And so when I went to the detectives, a lot of guys at that time would go there and stay in those precinct detective jobs their whole career, rest of their career because they wanted the Monday through Friday day job. But, you know, that's not what I was looking for. So I tried to do, fortunately, there were a bunch of other young guys coming into that squad. And we would do serious, proactive investigations and go out and arrest people and serve search warrants and kind of got ourselves noticed. So I was there for two years. And then I got an opportunity to go downtown to work in sex crimes, which uh, is nasty, nasty work. It's child molest cases and adult rapes. And and they asked me if I, I wanted to work there because a, a former supervisor that I had in the precinct detectives went down there and he called me up and said, why don't you come down and work sex crimes? I said, hell yes. So because that's downtown, you know, that's a citywide. You're, and the other thing is they were right next to homicide. The office was physically right next to homicide. So I went down there and, you know, got introduction to uh, my first introduction to real violent crime and rapists and child molest. And it's just a sweatshop. There was so much work, you know, you're just constantly cases he pouring in. And, but, you know, I was, again, I was out making arrests, serving search warrants, bringing bad guys in. I was there for two years and I was, I remember I was sitting at my desk at that time we used manual typewriters or like, not manual, physical, I was typing a report and one of the homicide sergeants came walking over and he goes, Hey, Cloyd, do you have any interest in working homicide? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> oh, okay. And he walked away. A couple months later, I had my, my orders. I was going to homicide and that was in yeah. 1994. And I stayed there the rest of my career because that was my goal. And, and, you know, when I did that, I said, I don't want to just be a homicide detective. I want to be a really good homicide detective. I said that to myself. I didn't say it to other people. So mm -hmm. I want to work hard and, and get a reputation as being a really good homicide detective. So I tried to do that and, you know, went the extra mile and did stuff and, you know, worked hard on cases. And, uh, you know, I just developed this knack for it. And I think I always tell people, I think I was divinely designed to do this job because I have the abilities, the tools, but I also have the personality where, you know, it's not going to drive me into a bottle or I'm going to have family problems at home because I'm not going to obsess about these crimes all the time. I'm still going to have, you know, I, I made a point because, you know, I had three sons. I made a point that I'm going to still do all the things that dad has to do. I would be working in an evening on a murder and one of my sons would have a football game. I would leave and go to the football game, watch it. And when it was done, say good job what and come back to work and go to work because that's what you got to do you got to prioritize so i would do that again it was and i'm not living right i they, we didn't live in the city where i was 25 miles south so you know it, i had to drive and then sometimes the games were farther south you know so i'd drive wherever they were and it, i and i just made a point to do that and, you know i did the stuff was involved in my kids lives all the time and family stuff and didn't let did not let this in although it did interfere because what would happen is i would be at some family thing and my phone would ring and next thing I know, I'm going to a murder, you know, obviously, if it's a fresh murder, you got to do that. And then, uh, but you know, you got to just take priorities. And then my personality, uh, doing, I develop an ability to interview and interrogate people, I end up teaching that, you know, and, and teaching detectives, a lot of other stuff in the end. So, you know, uh, that, that it just was, I just seemed to have a knack for it. I'll tell you, as you were talking, and as you're describing the things that you did to become a good homicide detective and, and even to, to get in there, you know, it's like a lifelong goal from when you were really young. Right. And it's funny and not, not necessarily funny, but it's, it's, it's ironic that every single thing that you hear from all the experts about how to become successful in anything, mm -hmm. you just described it. Right. You just did it. And you probably didn't even consciously know that you were doing it, but you were doing it, you know, to anybody that actually wants to understand exactly how to be successful in business, in your family or anything else, you know, you just described it. So, right. you know, kudos well, you to know, you, I, man. People ask me all the time, you know, like old childhood friends, well, how did you ever get a job as a homicide detective? And I said, well, I found out what I needed to do to get there and I did it. 
You know, <laughs> but the thing is, you know, when I when I was a detective, even got my first detective job, I thought, I wonder if I'll ever make it to homicide because you know, there's not that many jobs, and a lot of people want them. So you know, the thing is, when you got and you, and they don't just take anybody in homicide. So every every step you got to work a little more than your is is expected of you. Do more than is expected. And people will look at you and recognize that you're a hard worker. And, and that makes, that opens doors for you. You know, that's, it does. Well, and I'll also say like Cheryl McCollum told me uh, in the last conversation that we had that she was like volunteer. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. the, the, the things that you do that you don't get paid for are right. actually the things that will pay you the most. They do. Yeah. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. And you it know, opens doors because people does. recognize, yeah, people recognize that this guy's willing to do this for nothing. So, you know, right. yeah. Just for the experience. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. In fact, my dad, when I was growing up, my dad grew up on a ranch in Idaho. Mm -hmm. You will never see a harder working person right. than, you know, farmers and ranchers, oh, yeah. those guys. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, if that, if that calf is being born at 2 a.m. and you've already put in a 16-hour day, it doesn't matter. There. Yeah, you, you go out and you you take care of whatever you got to take care of. And if it if it takes all day to, to do that, then that's what you, it's just what you got to do. Well, that's the way with any business owner. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's no Monday through Friday, eight to four for any business owner. Because, right. you, you know, things are going on all the time. And you want to build your business and it might take 16 hours. And at first you may not barely make any money doing it. You know, that's it's and that's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great. Everybody, it's great to be your own boss, but you know, you work harder when you're your own boss than you do well, any other time. Yeah, and the rewards will come. It and, will and come. That's, yeah, that's, that's the thing. That's, the, that's what makes yeah. it a desirable thing. Right. right. Well, but it's it, what you just described is you were essentially Cloyd Steiger's business owner. Right. And you know the the Cloyd Steiger was in charge of Cloyd Steiger. Yeah, that's exactly and right. Yeah. Your your career was successful because mm -hmm. you implemented the exact same things that anybody else that actually wants to be successful that you did it. Right. And, and now you're reaping the rewards and, yeah. you know, a lot of those rewards come later in life and, you know, I'm doing the exact same thing with MVAC systems and right. even with, even with this video and podcast, you know, I'm not putting in the work right now in order to be successful right now. Right. And I exactly. think this is one of the things that really gets lost on the younger generation right now, especially right. the kids coming out of college and everything. It's like, if you're coming straight out of college and all of a sudden you're demanding, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? sorry, you know what? Yeah. I, I mean, maybe somebody will pay you that. Maybe. Yeah. And if, if they're stupid enough to do it, then more power <laughs> to them. But you know, but, instant gratification, that's what everybody wants. And that's right. the thing. It, it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. Right. And that yeah. instant gratification, I think, is one of the biggest cancers in all of society right now. I think that right there, well, instant gratification and then lack of individual responsibility. Right. I mean, people it, not uh, entitlement when people think they're entitled to stuff without earning it. Yeah. Right. If you if you haven't actually put in the time and earned it, right. and maybe it's not the time, but you actually have to put in the effort. Effort, yeah. Somehow yeah, exactly. you have to prove that you actually deserve what it is you're asking for. Right. And, and know, if you do the effort, you'll get it. You know, that's the thing. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, and, and that's the thing that I, I think there's far too many people that just aren't getting it. It's like, right. look, life will pay you whatever mm -hmm. you ask, but right. you have to put in the effort. Right. You know, you hear like Tony Robbins and all these other really super successful people and they talk Grant, Grant Cardone. I'm a huge fan of him. You know, there's other people like there's a, a girl named Shay Robottom, who if you're on LinkedIn, pretty much everybody on, on LinkedIn knows Shay Robottom now. And, uh, and there's other people that are surrounded uh, Shay that are hugely successful now as well. And, but it's all because she put in the time and, and even though she's really young, uh, and her story is just absolutely fascinating. And it, boy, we are way, way off topic. For, <laughs> yeah, that's outside okay. of law enforcement here. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's it, it's it all ties in because honestly, if you want to be successful at whatever you choose in life, 
And whether it's a, you know, law enforcement or business or broadcasting or anything else in life, you have to put in the effort. You do. And if you do, you'll get paid for it. That's the bottom line. And it's, uh, yeah, what, what you just described to me is just the epitome of what I think everybody needs to hear, whether or not they're in law enforcement or not, because right. you literally just by talking about what you actually did to become a homicide detective to me is just the epitome of the success formula right there. So yeah, I appreciate you doing, you know, spelling that out for us, man. Sure so, thing. so now talk to me about once you, became, once you got into homicide, talk to me, maybe, you know, describe that first year. What was it like to, uh, well, well I, okay. So, so hold that thought. <laughs> okay. Something just popped into my head. So I've actually interviewed some people that, that have worked in sex crimes for a long time. Right. And why is it that that job is, I don't know, so transient, really? I mean, it seems like once, once uh, detectives get into sex crimes, they, is it just because it's so uh, mentally brutal? To, it to is cross. really brutal. Yeah, it'll burn you out. Although I had a couple, I had a couple friends that were there for 16, 17 years, and yeah, uh, which is you know a long time to do sex crimes because it is it's it's draining. First of all, the workload is tremendous. I didn't even realize how much pre- stress I was under working there till I left, <laughs> and I went mm-hmm. to homicide. And I'd say. I went, I, I went to homicide because death is much easier than sex. So you know, yeah. it was like, you know, just like this, when you get a homicide, you're, all your attention goes to that one case a lot, you know, for, and you're working that one case, but when you're in sex crimes, they're coming, you have a 10 cases going, you're trying to balance. If you screw up on one, it might be the lead story at five tomorrow. Right. And then the depravity you see and kid victims and, and, and but don't get me wrong. I mean, I was, I, there was a lot of satisfaction in, getting people that were abusing that, kids that, that there was that physical sense. abuse and sexual abuse yeah, yeah. well that, i would i would think as brutal as that especially kids oh my right. gosh I, I don't know how the sex crimes guys do the you, you know when there's kids involved yeah because, well you have to you, well you get the problem is you know it's time to leave this is what i tell people when some guy's telling you all the terrible things that they did to a kid and it's not affecting you because you've heard it so many times you know, it's just a conversation. You go, nah, I got to get out of here. I mean, no, I, I, know. I never yeah. got to that point where I thought I had to get out of there because I was removed from there anyway. But um, yeah, well, but when you, I, I, I would talk to these guys and they would and they would confess to me all these terrible things they did. And I didn't, you know, they, how do you not reach across the table and strangle? Well, I didn't even feel that emotion because this is business. I do this for a living. I hear it all the time. So I'm, it wasn't that emotional shock that you get, right? But yeah. at the same time, you're you're describing these cases coming in all the time. So obviously, you know, the sex crimes department is severely understaffed. It is. They are, yeah. And underfunded. And I know these guys are, they're almost like the redheaded stepchildren because they don't get the near the funding that like homicide does. Right. And yet in my mind, the amount of sex crimes and the, just the absolute grossness and depravity that oh, yeah. is is in a lot of these crimes. Yeah. I think the vast majority of society has absolutely no clue. No clue at all. Well, you know, I was I was a when I went to sex crimes, I was a cop for like 12 years. And I thought I had a clue, but I know when I got there, I didn't have a clue, right? <laughs> mm. Because yeah, the, the whole thing is my idea of really nasty was here, but it ended up being right up here because there's so much going on. And you know, and I I would say is there any family in this city that isn't having sex with their kids? That's almost what it felt like, you know, uh, and it, of course that's not true. I mean, there are, but you know, all these areas where our normal suburbanish areas is that's where you, a lot of stuff's going on and, you know, and, and it's a, a, that way across the board in big city departments, but also these small rural sheriff's office, their detectives, most of their time they're taking is child molest cases and sex crimes, you know, and things like that. And because that goes on everywhere, you know, it goes on everywhere. And it's just, wow. uh, yeah. If we want to know why there's so many screwed up people in society. Oh, yeah. No, it's no that doubt. right there. The, I got to tell you, though, I the good side of that, without mentioning anything about the case, is I got a message about three or four years ago from a, a man saying, when I was a little boy, something terrible happened to me and you took care of me. And I just, I've always thought about you. And 
thank you for what you did. And, and we're Facebook friends now. I follow his family and everything. It's real nice. He's successful, got kids of his own. So that was very rewarding to me to ha have this, who was four, I think, when this stuff happened to him. Wow. is now an adult and you know, remembered and reached out to me about three or four years ago. And she said, I just want to always say thank you because you know, I got the guy and everything. And, and that was a stranger case. It wasn't a family case. Hmm. So, um, you know, that was, and that's a rewarding thing, you know, and one of those yeah. feel good stories. Well, I would think that right there is the only thing that can keep those guys going. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, it is, the, pro yeah. the professional and the personal reward of knowing that you have helped somebody that's the most innocent among us. Right. And yet you have, you have been literally kind of like their hero, their, right. you know, superstar, their captain America type that you've, you've made their life so much just infinitely better. Yeah. You hope so. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's just the thought of that, I think is right. You would have to have that in order to you keep to, going yeah. because well, a lot of the, the, a lot of these people that are in there for years, they just become numb to it, right? It's just work. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but I, I know that they're all good people, you know, and, and, and you talk to them now, oh God, yeah. But how did you stay there 17 years? <laughs> did that happen? I could never have done that. You know, I wasn't made up that way. I probably right. could have done it, but I would have not liked to do it. Yeah, you know, that's a long time to stay in that unit. Yeah, well, I, I've, I, of, of all the guys that I've talked to, they say, you just get so burned out. And you do get burned out. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, they turn to the bottle. It's like, right. how do you as a, as a respectable and normal human being see the level of uh, abuse, especially with children, but again, oh, yeah. you know, seeing the abuse against uh, women and, and wives and things like yeah. that, that, yeah, I don't know how a lot of them do it, but thank God they there's do. a big need for it. You know, yeah. that's the thing. well, it, it, and there's probably 10 X the need of what is actually funded and what no. is actually provided for. And, and then, of course, now we, when people talk about defunding the police, what, who are you going to have handle that? You're going to send a counselor to investigate this crime? You know, the, the victim needs a counselor, but the suspect doesn't need a counselor. <laughs> the suspect no. needs a pair of handcuffs, right? No, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the yeah. things, uh, like Zeke said, it's a lot of these people that are committing these crimes have committed them before. Oh, yeah. A lot of them have served time. Yeah. And a good friend of mine, Tom Myers, always says leopards very, very seldom change their spots. That's exactly right. And these sex offenders, they, a lot of them, they do it over and over and That's over. That's who they are. That's their yeah. personality. They, it's not like, and they're, like I said, I, you know, you can talk to somebody till you're blue in the face and, and counsel them. You're not going to change their sexual identity, right? It just is a, a warped thing of life that that's who they are for whatever reason, but you're not going to talk them out of it and you're not going to put them, there's no treatment that's going to cure them of it. You can control their access and things like that. That's the only thing you can do. You can't talk to them enough to talk them out of that because that's who they are. By the time they're doing that, it's too late to change them. You need to do that when they're two, <laughs> you know, and right. develop, develop them as, as, as loved things and not abused children and everything because by the time they're adults and the committing i i had one guy that it was a long it's a long story i won't tell the whole story but his wife ran a daycare and there was an allegation that he inappropriately touched one girl and first of all when i went there and he wasn't home but his wife was there she started describing why it wasn't him and i realized she was talking about a completely different case than i was there to investigate so that's the first alarm and long story short we got a man he was 35 years old I talked to him from like 3.30 in the afternoon till almost 11 o'clock at night. And he confessed to doing dozens of children his entire life since he was 15 years old, never even been suspected before. And he just, and he just, it just, because I got, I, what I was doing was I was bluffing him. I told him I knew about others that I didn't know about. And ironically, one of, it, one of his neighbors was a little girl whose stepdad was abusing her. And so I said, I know about so-and-so too. And they just, and he had a shocked look on his face because he'd been abusing her also, right? And so he mm. just rolled and rolled and rolled. And, you know, the only good thing about that was when I was taking him away to jail at almost midnight, he looked at me and said, Detective Steiger, I know you don't like me. I, you think I'm a bad man. And his name was Frank. I put my hand on his back and said, Frank, I don't think anything less of you now than I did when I first met you. <laughs> of course, he didn't get that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I thought you were a piece of crap then. I still do. But he didn't get that. Oh, thank you. He said, <laughs> right. and I took him to jail. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, as a, just as a dad and as a human, I, I look at guys like that and, and I think you, you just want to help them. You, yeah. you, you want to provide these people with whatever it is they need in order to become, you know, decent human beings. Yeah. But there is a reality, especially after talking to guys like uh, Lee Miller. Right. And you just have to get into your mind that there are people out there. First of all, evil exists. Evil. I'm here to testify that evil exists a lot and not, not, not by percentage of the population, but there are a lot of evil people out there and, and people are naive to think they're not. And no matter, no amount of laws you pass or anything is going to control their evil because that's who they are. They're predators and you're naive to think they're not. Uh, fortunately, like I said, it's a very small part of the population, but that very small part of the population causes a tremendous amount of the problems. Oh, the carnage is amazing. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, and the, the perpetual carnage that comes from abusing kids. Oh yeah. Because those kids become so psychologically damaged. Right. A lot exactly. of them turn into predators themselves. Themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And exactly. You know, you, somehow society needs to break this cycle and the, you are not going to do it by defunding the police. No. As a matter you know, of fact, it's, it's going to make it worse. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because then you're just giving this small section of population, the people that are actually are evil, that do this kind of carnage, you're just giving them free reign. And and they'll exploit that because they think that way. You know, they see that as weakness and they'll exploit any weakness they see. I I think they are some of the, the most masterful manipulators. No. Oh in, in all of society. And yeah, it's just like, you know, you and I have sat down and looked at the same cases mm -hmm. and said, if this guy would have just put in this kind of effort into a career, he'd be a millionaire. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. But that's not who they are. You know? No, no, they, they have urges and they have these uh, mm -hmm. mental things going on that they can't control. And they get satisfaction from from abusing or seeing suffering in other people and they don't care about the other person as a human they care of, they think of the other person as an object for them to right. uh, get their satisfaction from right and we do we don't do ourselves any favors by thinking that that and and putting in the back of our minds because i i think honestly most people have these rose-colored glasses on no they do and they view other people in the same way that they view themselves Right. Which all of us do. Right. Sure. That's just human nature. But right. it's like you, if you're a good person and you view other people as good people and, and all of, frankly, all of us should. Yeah. All yeah of us, should, that should be the default position, right. assuming everybody's good, but, but keep your eyes open for signs that that's not true. You right. Know? <laughs> yeah. Obviously just because you are, yeah. want, yeah. Just yeah. because you want other people to be as, as good of a person as you are, doesn't yeah. mean that's true. That's right. It doesn't. Uh, and, you know, it's evil exists. Satan is out there. And as long oh, yeah. as Satan is out there, which you have no control over, yeah, as long exactly. as Satan is out there, evil people will exist. They and will. Evil people will exploit your weaknesses. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to be aware of that. And just absolutely. like every single person as a, on a personal level has to become a better person and should be working on that individually. There's other people that are going the exact opposite direction. Uh, no question. And their, their whole purpose in life in their minds is to take advantage of people like us. Exactly. And, That's and, exactly right. They're like yeah. a predator in the jungle looking for their, their prey and what they can do. Matter of fact, I've had, I've had people tell me, I was looking for prey. What's a prey? A person. <laughs> They've used the ex exact phrase. So, you right. know, people, they're my prey. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, and you said it earlier, the, the fact that they don't look at them as another person. Right. They look at they them don't. as an object. And exactly. They have this some kind of a carnal, crazy desire. And some of the, and like, again, I refer back to Dr. Meller. He has studied this to the level that 
man he's got his phd doing it yeah right <laughs> exactly yeah and yeah. to be one of the probably three or four experts in the entire world on this kind of a dark mentality and, right and I, I frankly he's a special guy just to be able to study it because right. in listening to him um, i remember the very first asoc conference that i went to <laughs> i was presenting the mvac and it was, I, I think I was, I was getting on, I don't know, it was like, I don't know, four o'clock in the afternoon, or it, maybe it was even later than that. I can't remember. But yeah, all I remember is that I followed Dr. Miller <laughs> and he was giving a presentation on the, there's like four different categories of sexual predator that right. he was presenting. And, you know, there's these levels of uh, you know, rapists, and then people that get into all sorts of, how can I do this? How can I do this G rated, you know, yeah. paraphilias? There's a, yes, <laughs> you look it up in the dictionary. If you don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, there's a, but there's yeah. a level of evil that that guy fully understands. Oh yeah. And he was presenting at that conference. And right. I'm like, I guarantee you there is 0.001% of all of society that could sit through this right and understand it and right. actually be able to say yeah you know the, it's the level of evil that he has studied is absolutely just off the charts and yeah. thank thank goodness guys like him are out there because yeah. on the on the very very few people that are actually at that level mm -hmm. those are the type of people that i mean that's silence of the lamb stuff oh yeah Real and silence and lamb stuff. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's not Hollywood. This is no. real silence and lamb stuff, and it and it exists. Yeah, and it does. I had to present after that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember that, that conference in St. Louis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. was probably the worst presentation I've ever done because yeah. Yeah, I was covered. No, no. There's, uh, and you know, frankly, that was my first exposure to it. And yeah, yeah. I'm sitting here and, you know, I'm a military veteran. Right. And I, I think I, I studied chemical warfare and right. the effects of, you know, chemical weapons on people right. and that kind of stuff. And I, I, I thought that I was uh, hardened enough that I could sit yeah. through that and not be affected. But I'll tell you what, I was affected. Yeah, no and kidding. To this day, I, I remember that presentation just stammering through the whole thing, just going like, I can't get the images out of my mind that right. I just saw. And, right. and he wasn't even presenting Gra real graphic stuff. No, right. I, I mean, there was yeah. some graphic stuff in there, there was but... yeah, but not n on the, the scale of the stuff he has. Believe me, I've seen the stuff he has. That was the lower oh. third, right? It yeah. wasn't the really, really bad stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so in the context of our conversation, when you think about like that presentation and what Dr. Meller talks about and, and mm -hmm. those kind of, and even some of the things that some of these detectives see when they are out there investigating right. sex crimes and child molestations and, but even some of the murders that you've seen, right. yeah, some of those are so demented. Oh, that, a lot of them are. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you, you look at them and you're like, how do, how does a, a human do this to another human? Well, you, you learn pretty quickly that they do. And, you know, you just have to, you can't fix, get yourself wrapped up in how this guy became that way. You just got to get wrapped up in how do I get this guy? You know, that's the thing. Or find out who he is or she is or things like that. Let me, I want to go back real quick because you mentioned Hannibal Lecter. And I want, one of the points I want to make is real predators and serial killers and nasty people don't look like Hannibal Lecter. They look like the guy that Moses lawn down the street or your mailman or the guy you work with. They look like normal people, <laughs> but they have a life that you don't know about. You know, mm -hmm. that's the thing. So everybody's, if ever, if all the really bad guys were like Hannibal Lecter, it'd be easy because nobody would go near them. Right. <laughs> but, but they yeah. look like normal people on the surface, serial killers. They look like normal people. And so you gotta, that's why they're so dangerous. They're chameleons and they'll draw you in. And you won't realize but Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, who was a deacon in his church and everything. And he would walk in his neighborhood with his daughter. And there was a neighbor down the street and he does say, hi, how you doing? Hi, hi, hi. Well, he later came back and killed her. Right. She, she, she thought of him as the neighbor, Dennis, the neighbor down the street, who's very friendly. But, you know, 
And, but that's who that because it was such a predator. She she probably let him come on in, Dennis. You know, and he murdered her. And that's you know that's the thing. Yeah, so you never not not you should be worried that everybody you see is a serial killer or anything like that, or live your life in that fear. You can't. But don't believe that you can. You would recognize a serial killer if you saw one, because I guarantee you, you would not. Right. right.